you tell us about your upbringing? Sure. Uh, I come from rural, central rural Maine, from the hills. I'm a hillbilly. And uh, grew up in a big country family. And we were, um, I guess you'd call us low income. There was no extra money. My dad was a factory worker. And my mom worked in a, in a 20 bed rural hospital. But we had a fantastic great grandmothers and my grandmothers and a big, lo pretty loving family. And they always, um, they always encouraged me to do my, my artwork. But it's kind of weird. In rural Maine, you just, you know, I, I was all creative and they thought I was a little crazy. And I told them that I, when I grew up, I wanted to move to New York. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand why I just would spend all this time in my room making paintings. And just, I was crazy about art. And so, uh, but, they, but they didn't get in my way. They were supportive and they encouraged me in everything that I wanted to do. But to be honest, I'm kind of crazy, so they didn't have much of a choice. I was going to do what I wanted to do anyways. And, uh, and they've been, they've been uh, proud of me since, ever since then. Uh, as an adolescent, um, how did art affect you as a, as a young kid? Like... Oh, I, I was an artist ever since I was, like, ever since I can remember. As an adolescent, I was really, really involved with uh, Marvel Comics and the X-Men. And so I just made my own comic books and I just lived every month for when the comics would arrive at the drugstore and I'd save up my paper route money and just dash down there. And I had this fantasy at the age of 14 growing up in rural Maine in the country that I'm going to move to New York and draw for Marvel Comics. And years later I did move to New York but I went to, went to School of Visual Arts there and uh, started doing my teaching work as well. Besides yeah. um, Marvel Comics, was there any like museums that you used to go to or anything like that? It was in a country, yeah, but was there any other out art outlet anywhere? No, the only thing you might have is you might have an exhibition of watercolors in a park nearby or something. And there was nothing, but I will never forget the day that I went on a field trip when I was in junior high school. And it was in the eighth grade. And so there was a field trip and we took a bus to Boston. And I went to the Museum of Fine Arts for the first time. And I'm looking at all this stuff. And everybody wants to go see the mummies. And I went to the contemporary art section. And this must be, this is in the 70s. And on the wall, I saw these cardboard boxes with paint on them that had been taken apart and put back on the wall. And all my friends were laughing at it. And even my teachers like saying, mm, I think this is a joke. And I said, you know what? If this is what art could be, and if this is what an artist can give him or herself permission to do, I am so down with this. And the artist's name was Robert Rauschenberg. And it wasn't many years later where we're sitting in his loft having a conversation about the work that I'm doing with, K with KOS. So um, yeah, that, that was the moment when I knew I'm going, I'm going to go for it. What made you choose New York over any other big city? I think it's because um, I really wanted to be a fine artist. I knew I wanted to be a painter, I wanted to do sculpture, I wanted to do conceptual art, and I knew that I probably would have to be in New York to have access to, to all the different resources, and especially artists, that I wanted to meet. And I actually um, came to New York to study with one particular artist at the School of Visual Arts, and his name was Joseph Kosuth, and he's the father of the conceptual art movement. And it wasn't within two weeks of coming to New York. I didn't know anybody. I was scared to death. I had hardly any money at all, and Joseph hired me to be his assistant. And like two weeks later, I'm meeting Andy Warhol and Robert Rauschenberg and all these amazing artists and, and, and learning about the, the art business from the ground up. And I'm very grateful for that experience. I had to be in New York for that. How did you decide that you want to help teens rather than be a solo artist? It's interesting because when I was um, uh, at SVA and when I moved to, to New York, back home we, we, you're poor, but you're country poor, so you have nature and it isn't like in your face the way I saw things in certain neighborhoods in, in New York City, especially the South Bronx. And I thought, you know, it's great to be alone in the studio and make your own work, but there's something so exciting about being with young folk and especially young folk that really want to be artists, but they don't know how to go about doing it. And I sort of fell into it. I, 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 I was political. I wanted to make sure that my work served somebody. And so um, I ended up taking on the sadomasochistic act of becoming a New York City public school junior high school teacher on Kelly Street in the South Bronx. I got adopted. 
Uh, a lot of people say, Tim, how you know, did a white guy like you end up in the South Bronx? And I said, you don't understand, the South Bronx ended up in me. Uh, I get joy out of it. Uh, nothing is more exciting than, than, let's say, meeting Robert at the age of 16, and then he ends up going to Cooper Union, then he ends up going to Teachers College in Columbia. Uh, university and, and now he's following me into teaching and educational technology and that's it's just as thrilling, if maybe not even more thrilling than finishing beautiful work like the one in, ba in back of us right now. So, so how did you go from teaching the students to uh, working with them to make uh, the grand pieces of art? This was interesting because uh, we really couldn't hardly get anything done in a school that had eight periods a day, 40 minutes a period, the bells ringing all the time. And this school was a crazy school. I mean, so many distractions and disruptions. And I found out that we did much better work after school. And so the kids just started hanging out and hanging out. And these are kids that never wanted to come to school in the first place, right? And all of a sudden, you can't kick them out. And I said, you know what we need? And we started making these beautiful works together, inspired by classics of world literature and music. And I said, you know, we're going to have to get a space of our own. I feel it. So I actually um, ran around and raised a little bit of money. And then we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. We got an $8,000 grant. And we were able to rent a studio of our own in a community center about three blocks away from the school. So here we have a lot of young folk who have been diagnosed as learning disabled, special ed, emotionally handicapped, academically at risk, dyslexic. Uh, a attention deficit disorder, knuckleheads, truants, kids that hate school but they love art and they come after school and they stay from three to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. Uh, parents bring over food, we'd work on the weekends and we were really a team, we were collaborating on, on making works of fine art and we had the audacity to believe that we could be showing in major galleries and museums. It was just sheer audacity and, and trust and hope and faith in, in our abilities. Um, why did you uh, pick classic literature to base your artwork on? The main reason was that I had all these experts telling me that, that my students wouldn't be able to handle these texts, these classics, that they wouldn't be able to comprehend them that this is beyond their level. And that made me angry, because I just didn't believe it. And uh, I, so I said, by hook or by crook, we're going to have these books be part of our life. One of my great heroes is an American philosopher, African-American philosopher named W.E.B. Du Bois. And he says in Souls of Black Folks, I sit beside Shakespeare, and he winces not. Shakespeare, I, I just got finished teaching at Harvard, and I just told those folk right there, Shakespeare didn't write just for comparative literature students at Harvard, huh? and he didn't just write for rich folk. He wrote for the ages, and, and son, he wrote for you and your generation, because you know, a lot of you know this, especially in the Bronx, um, tragedy is not an aesthetic category for us that we admire. We know what that means. We know what comedy means, because I've seen you all act out. Right? So uh, it's just having that connection of, of great literature because th those are the big issues that are in our life and, it's, and they're quite universal. And there's something just so powerful about being in communion with, with these great, great writers and these great, great issues and these great themes. What is your process like in creating the art? The process? Um, wow. Basically, you know what happens is that I get an intuition. I get a feeling when I encounter a new work of literature, when I'm researching ideas. It depends on maybe something's going on in the lives of some of us in the group. And so maybe that reminds me of, of, of something. But what's interesting is that we've never done a book that I was familiar with. So what I happen to do is, is I get uh, research and I start reading. And if I get excited, and if I catch on fire, then the whole studio catches on fire because there's a mystery. I mean, you know, this is a, an attempt to solve a genuine mystery. It's on A Midsummer Night's Dream after Shakespeare and, and Mendelssohn. And uh, what we want to know is that in the play, there is a flower, a magic flower that has the power to make you fall in love with the next living thing you see upon awakening. And the only person that can find this flower is a little knucklehead named Puck. And Puck is the artist spirit. And so I'm asking everybody if you could portray that flower in watercolor and mulberry paper, 
what would this magic flower look like? So that, and, and I don't know. I can't tell you, your art teacher can't tell you, your mother can't tell you. And so together, we start as a team, it's like an orchestra or a choir. We start riffing, as they say in jazz, and I, I got a little thing here. Then Robert says, oh, I can do better than that. You know? And then Rick goes, I'll do better than any of you. Doom, boom, boom, boom. And then the project just grows very organically. And it's over a long period of time, trust me. Uh, it, sometimes it'll happen in a week or a month. Lots of times it takes two to three to four years to get an idea. And then once we get the idea and learn the craft and the technique and, know, and get our materials together and get the scale of it, then it tends to just flow beautifully. But it takes a long time to get that, that initial spark going. Are there any ideas that haven't been turned into a work of literature that have just gone off and not followed through? For years, I've been looking and reading Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, and I don't know why. And we haven't gotten it yet. And sometimes we'll be washing brushes, or just you know eating lunch together, or just walking down the street, and then one of us will go, "Wait a minute!" And I call that the Eureka moment. What about this? And what if we try this? And what if we try this? And uh, it becomes obvious. Everyone again starts riffing on it until we get something that is very um, commanding and powerful and convincing. Uh, how does the literary work affect which materials you use? We, we, I always say, say to the, the participants, don't illustrate this text or this music. Don't do that because it's, it's not what we're going for. We want to be inspired by these, these texts, but we don't want to just illustrate them. We want to come up with what we call a visual correspondence, something that captures the spirit of the text, something that engages with the issues of the text. But people, sometimes they'll come and they'll look for a very literal, I don't know, interpretation of what we're doing on the text, and we are literary, but we don't want to be literal. We want to have something that has some mystery. We want to have, have something that you complete in, in your spirit and in your mind when you encounter the work in a gallery or museum or in a public place. As you're doing your artwork, do you control the paintbrush or do the paintbrush control you? Oh, very good. No, I always do this. I, I say, no, the, the paintbrush controls me. Um, Lots of times I'll get, especially fifth graders, little younger ones, and they kind of stare in the space, and they don't know what to do. And I say, come here. And I say, what, what's, I'm on the blackboard. What's this? It's a blackboard. What's this? A piece of chalk. And what is this? Blackboard. What is this? A piece of chalk, you know? And I go watch. And I stare in the space, and I just start, and I lose myself, and I listen to the voice that tells me where to go. And I say, can I ask you a question? What? Does this chalk know what's moving it? Now, you become the chalk. You have what, the, um, the oomph moment, what was it? What is it? The, the eureka, eureka moment. moment. Jamel Shabazz had the decisive moment, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, how do you know when something feels right? Like, what's the gut instinct? Like, I, it's really hard like, to understand some of the artwork that you put together. Like, I know it's based on passive literature, but mm -hmm. what's that? What's that, can you explain the feeling that you get, like when you know it's a... You, yeah. Piece, uh, you know it's gonna be boom. You know, like emerald, boom. You just, you nail it. And we got it. And then what we do is we say, okay, let's not party yet. Let's not celebrate yet. Let's keep making a lot of these things. We make a whole lot of trash to get to the treasure. Our, mo our most important uh, uh, instrument in the studio is the garbage can. And we work our way through all these experiments in order to get something that is convincing and says, yeah, this has power, this has mystery. This is something I've been wanting to look at for a long time, and hopefully other people will as well. It becomes quite obvious. And especially since we're a collaborative team, it isn't just me saying, oh, that's great. Because sometimes you know, I'll say, wow, this is great. And Rick will go, are you kidding? And this is so corny. And, and so we bounce back and forth. But when we feel it together as a team, you just know you, you, we nailed it. And then, and then, and then we can um, put it out into the world and see if it can survive without us telling everyone how great it is. Right. You spoke about being a team, uh, but uh, you were an artist before. Have, have you ever thought about or have you done art by yourself? I, I can't even imagine doing that. 
you know, that's like having, you know, Leonard, uh, Leonard Bernstein, the great conductor? And it's like having, I'm going to the New York, New York Philharmonic tonight, and it'd be like having, I mean, me working alone would be like having the conductor like this and an orchestra. You look like a fool. Most artists' idea of heaven is my idea of hell. Most artists would love to be in their studio at least six hours a day with whatever music they had, no interruptions, and making their beautiful work, have it go out into the world and become successful. And that's, that's the standard uh, model for what an artist does, a fine artist. My, that's my idea of hell. If I don't have the, the, all this craziness, the pandemonium in the studio, and everyone laughing, and the TV's on, and the music is on, and, we're re and, we're, and I'm making books on tape you know, for, the, for the literature, for the kids that don't read well, if I don't have all that pandemonium, I feel sad and lonely and bored. So um, no, I, I, don't, I don't imagine uh, uh, having an individual uh, solo practice in the realm of art. Maybe something else, but not particularly that. I think that's our, the whole thing of uh, Tim Rollins and KOS is the fact that it has survived over 25 years as a, as a team uh, with veterans and with new, new, new kids joining and there's something quite hopeful and, 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 and actually wonderful about that. I wouldn't want to mess that up now. I work too hard. I've been through a lot. Been through so a lot. I'm, I'm, not walking off, I'm not walking away from the table now. No way. I want to give our words to taking the uh, faces of politicians and putting on the bodies of animals. Do politics affect your artworks? Sure. What's going on in the world affects our artwork enormously. And so it isn't like we're just putting pretty colors together, although artists who do that are fine. I love art. I, l I love beauty. And I love uh, anyone. It's, it's all good. Anyone can do whatever they want to do. But I think considering, look, look at us. Here we are. We're in the poorest congressional district in the United States. Uh, it's not going to be just about pretty colors, although we often do that. But we also do work that's uh, directly political, and you're talking about the series we made on the pages of Animal Farm by George Orwell, where we, uh, we portray world leaders as barnyard animals. And that comes from a great, great history uh, of caricature, especially um, the French from 19th century, Daumier and Philippon and Granville. And so again, not only do we read the animal farm, but we, I'm hauling everyone to museums constantly. And we go not to worship these artworks, although if you want to do that, go ahead. But we go to steal. Not literally, but we go to, I'm going to use that, and I'm going to take that, and we'll take that, and then we're going to synthesize it in a way so that maybe some people will know the history of what we did, but we like to cover up our tracks, and it's like, it's, a, it's synthetic. You take something from here, from here, from here, and you, you put it together in a way that's truly our own. And that, yeah, that's why the, yeah, politics really do affect our, what we want to do, what we want to say. But we're also capable of uh, making work that, that is just plain old beautiful. The greatest test of our commitment to this work came on Valentine's Day in 1993, when one of our favorite kids, Chris Hernandez, was murdered by a drug dealer. Uh, it, was a, it was a massacre in his apartment building. And my world ended. I loved Chris so much, and we raised him in that group. And I, there was a moment, actually a couple of years, where I don't know, I didn't bargain for this when I started at the age of, what, 24 years old, being a junior high school teacher in the South Bronx. I thought it was all going to be about making the art and the joy of creation and exhibiting and traveling all over the world. And I, 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 it was a rough, rough couple of years. But what, 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 what changed me was the fact that one of the last things that Christopher had made was a painting based on From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. And it was actually bought and collected by the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. And they called me up. And this was about two years after the murder. And going through all that craziness and the trial and the, was the pain, the grief. And they said, um, we're going to show From the Earth to the Moon in a big show of the permanent collection. Do you want to come on down? And I wasn't sure. And I could get through it. And Rick said, oh, I'm going. And the other folks said, we're going to go. We want to go. And we took the train down and walked into that exhibition on that night of the opening and went downstairs. And there was the painting 
And that is when I realized what this art thing is all about. He was there. He was so powerfully there. And I thought, what if he never had done art? What if he had never left anything behind? He was there. And this is why we call ourselves Kids of Survival, because this is how we survive. Art is not about making just beautiful things, although that's great. Art's not about being in fancy galleries, although that's terrific. But we make art in order to survive as a people, as a spirit, as a voice, and as a, as a presence in this crazy world of